from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, the 102nd Psalm, and beginning with verse 5, well, say just 6. I'm like a pelican of the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Today, I went for a few minutes out into the foothills and took a little walk down a little road. I didn't want to go too far because they told me there were rattlesnakes around there. I'm not a friend of rattlesnakes for some reason. No, they're not my friend. We have a lot of them where I live, so we have experience with them. I let my wife kill those. <laughs> and she does. She's not afraid of, well, she's not afraid of anything that I ever heard of. to say that today as I walked out on that little place I began to think and meditate a little bit and I watched a bird I don't know the name of that bird it's a big bird and it has different colors it may be a magpie I'm not sure but it certainly has a strange sound to North Carolina ears and then the bird sat on a fence post and he sat there by himself no mate came around. Now, we have a lot of doves where I live, and as you know, they mate for life, and they go around together, and they have friendship and fellowship and uh, produce little children, little birds. <laughs> and, uh, but this bird today seemed to be all alone, and I thought about this passage of Scripture that's found in the 101st of 102nd Psalm. I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl in the desert. I watch in him as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. You know, tonight, there are many lonely people here. Many single people in the city of Denver. 51% of your population is single. And many of those people are lonely. And one of the supreme problems of modern society is loneliness. The modern city is a lonely place. Here in America, 70% more people are living alone in one-person dwellings than 10 years ago. A New York psychiatrist was quoted the other day as saying, New York City is the loneliest place in the world for millions. What would you say about Denver or the town you come from? An American university study reported that university students are the loneliest people in the United States followed by divorced people. Are you lonely? One of the principal causes of loneliness is alcoholism and drug use. Alcohol and drugs are efforts to escape loneliness. Drugs take you on a trip and being drunk makes you feel that you've got somebody with you. On the other hand, Going with Christ is a trip in which you really always have Jesus with you as your Lord and companion. You cannot drink your way out of loneliness. Most young people turn to drugs for kicks and get hooked or peer pressure. But thousands turn to drugs because of loneliness. A magazine cover story recently had a neglected youth. It said that actually most of them are properly clothed and fed, but something is missing in the lives of millions. It's a neglect of the spirit, the article said, which leaves them lonely and prone to drugs and alcohol, but all too often leads to suicide. What can be done about it? One of the key words in the Bible is communion, from which we get our word communication. Jesus came to a man one time that was lonely and sick and paralyzed. 38 years he'd sat in the same spot, lonely and tired without a friend. And Jesus looked at him and said, do you need a friend? And he said, yes. 
This bundle of loneliness and human pain had been buffeted by the surging tides of thousands of people. But Jesus singled him out. He became his friend that day and he healed him. He can become your friend tonight if you'll let him. Loneliness began actually in the Garden of Eden, in a perfect paradise, when man and woman declared their independence of God. They said, we don't need you, God. We can build this world without you. So they made a terrible choice. They chose to turn away from God. They went their own way, tried to build their world, and sin entered at that beautiful garden. And it was given to the next generation, the next generation, the next, the next, down to you and me. And we all have the disease, and it's a fatal disease. Nobody ever escapes the judgment of the disease of sin. So you, the roots of loneliness were planted in the human soul and we, has been inherited by every inhabitant ever. Because you see, in that garden, God went looking for Adam. He knew where he was, but he went looking for him. He wanted Adam to know where he was. He said, Adam, where are you? And Adam tried to hide got some fig leaves and sewed them on. He didn't know he was naked till then. But he couldn't hide. Loneliness has never been a respect of persons. The world's greatest artists, writers and composers, kings and queens and carpenters and plumbers and everybody have felt this terrible thing called loneliness. In John 13, it tells about the Last Supper. And it tells about the betrayal of Judas. And the scripture says he went out and it was night. No one ever went away from Jesus but what it was night. Perhaps there was a time that you knew the fellowship of God's people and you had peace with God. But you've backslidden, you've gone away, you've turned away. You've fallen aside. There was a time when you knew Christ. You felt you knew him. There was a time when you felt you meant business with God, but now your heart has grown cold and hard towards spiritual things. You've been pulled away by others and other things and other gods and other pleasures that you know to be wrong. And you went out from the presence of God and you have found that it's night out there. You don't have fellowship with true believers and you don't feel really at home in the world you're living in. And certainly you no longer have fellowship with Christ. And there's no loneliness quite so bitter as the loneliness of a backslidden Christian who claims with his mouth that he knows Christ, but deep in his heart he knows he doesn't. How many of you are straddling the fence, trying to put one foot in God's kingdom and one foot in the world's kingdom? Sin makes us lonely because it separates us from God. And it was never in God's intention for you to be lonely. Hundreds of surveys prove that our society has not made us a better adjusted or happier society. Oh yes, we can have fleeting moments of sensual satisfaction, create a bitterness and a loss of sense of pleasure that no psychiatrist can cure. The Bible says that the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose water cast up mire and dirt. Remember the story of Jesus with the woman on the, at the well? She was a lonely woman. She had several husbands, had had several husbands, no satisfaction, no peace, no joy. Jesus came and talked to her, forgave her her sins, transformed her life made her a new person. She went into the village of Sychar and told all the people that here was someone that knows all about you. Come and see him. And they all went out to see Jesus. The Bible says he's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Even though great crowds surrounded him, at times he was alone. Even at the end, the scripture says, all the disciples forsook him and fled. The crowds who shouted one day, Hosanna, that same week, five days later, they were crucifying him. And at last we hear from the cross, Jesus on the cross dying for you and for me. 
God laying on him all of our sins and our judgment and our hell, which he took on that cross. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible moment, something mysterious happened. No theologian can explain it. Jesus took your sins, your judgment, your hell, all the penalty that I deserve for my sins, he took on that cross. And it was a lonely moment, a lonely period when he alone had to bear the cross and he became guilty of all the sins of the whole world. He experienced ultimate loneliness as he died for you and died for me. I've never understood how a person can turn away from Jesus when they actually see him on that cross. Dying for you and to reject him, to turn away when he offers you forgiveness, he offers you a new life, he offers you peace and joy and friendship, never to be lonely again. Through his death, Christ dealt with the primary cause of human loneliness, separation from God. Because hell essentially is separation from God. Hell is the loneliest place in the universe. Jesus suffered its agonies for you. Jesus was lonely for you. I remember when my grandmother died, I had the privilege of being there at that time. She sat up in bed with a smile and a glow on her face. Her husband had been wounded at Gettysburg, lost an eye, lost a leg at Gettysburg. And she sat up and she said, I see Ben, her husband, who had died some years earlier. And she said, oh, the music is so beautiful. And then she fell back on the pillow out in eternity. I remember when my mother was dying a relatively short time ago and all the wonderful sayings that she left behind on her deathbed because she just lived only for the Lord. She had a joy and a peace. You never went into her room that you didn't come out and feel that she was ministering to you. You didn't minister to her. And even when she was in a coma, she woke up one night and quoted scripture. And the nurse said she never saw such a look on anybody's face. And fell back into her coma and went into eternity. There's a great difference even in the last hour between those who know Christ and those who don't know him. Then there's the loneliness of your decision. Because you see, Christ died for you. He rose again. He's living. He wants to come into your heart. He offers you forgiveness and salvation and assurance and peace and joy. And he offers you a tough life. I'm not going to play games with you and tell you that it's easy to follow Christ. It's not. He said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up a cross and follow me, you can't, follow, you can't be my disciple. Now, the cross was a place where they executed criminals. It would be like today, he said, take up the electric chair and follow me. He said, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And he said, if you follow me, he said, you're going to have troubles and difficulties and problems and persecution and maybe death. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to go all the way with me to the cross? Oh yes, in the midst of it, there'll be his peace and his joy and his friendship and his forgiveness and his promise and the hope that he offers for the future. But there will also be the possibility of persecution and suffering and problems that you never dreamed of when you come to Christ. We've been in those parts of the world where people suffer because they come to Christ. You must make the decision about Christ yourself. Our reaction to loneliness is often to deal with the symptoms rather than the cause. We get involved in pleasures. 
parties, good times, sex. We get involved in our work. We throw ourselves into the social whirl at the school. We read one of the best-selling books which urges us to take control of our lives. Any attempt to deal with sin without conversion is like struggling in quicksand. And how many young people today and older people are struggling in quicksand, trying to save yourself, but you can't. You've come to the end of your rope. Turn your life over to Christ. Let him bear your burdens, help you solve your problems, help direct and lead you in your life. How many young people here tonight do not really know what you want to do with your life? Or help you in your marriage, who you ought to marry. There's a lady talked to me tonight who said she's just waiting for the right man to come along. And there are many like that. Be sure it's God's man, a God's woman. I remember I took my three daughters aside when they were, oh, they couldn't have been more than eight, nine, or 10 years of age. And I said, let's stop here in the mountain and pray for your husbands who you're going to marry, they're boys somewhere. And let's just pray that God will lead them and lead you and that they will be men of God. Well, they looked at me as though their dad had gone crazy. <laughs> but we prayed and they got the right men too. One of them's here tonight. And we prayed the same way for our sons, both for the first time in many, several years at least, both of my sons are here tonight. I don't know where they are, but they're here somewhere. But you have to make this decision alone. If we search for an antidote to loneliness and drugs and alcohol and sex and encounter groups and psychological experiences, often it all only serves to mire us deeper in despair without a remedy. Through Jesus Christ, we can have the most fundamental relationship in life restored. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. The psalmist that wrote that about the pelican and the owl said, Oh, my soul, why be so gloomy and discouraged? Trust in God. I shall again praise him for his wondrous help. He will make me smile again, for he is my God. Loneliness is often God's way of letting us know it is time to reach out, reach out to the cross and you'll never be lonely again. A couple of weeks ago, I received a letter which said, quote, about a month ago, my wife and I separated. She moved out of our house saying that she could not stand to be around me anymore. We'd gotten to a point where we could not communicate with each other anymore. We were throwing accusations, some founded and some not, and bitter, spiteful words at each other. So she moved out and went to live with another man until she could get an apartment of her own. On June the 8th this year, I had come home from work, and after dinner I felt a compulsion to turn on the tube. I attribute it to the loneliness and frustration I was feeling. Sometimes the tube can be an excellent fire escape for a short while but it's not a good fire extinguisher, he said. Anyway, I turned the set on and randomly flipped the dial. The station I had chosen was just announcing the beginning of the Billy Graham crusade from South Carolina. I don't mind telling you, I was more than a little skeptical about televised religious programs, but I continued to watch. At the end of your sermon, which I felt was directed at me and my situation, when you call those people who wanted to change the direction of their lives to come forward and receive Christ as their savior, I hesitated, but then I did. At this time, my wife and I are starting to put things back on track. Another one. Last night, I preached on John 3:16, and the people here said it all together for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life and last night more than 1700 people came and made their commitment to Christ a few weeks ago no no
A few weeks ago, in one of our crusades, a man looked at that same verse, and the counselor told him, you can put your name in that verse. You are the whosoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, put your name there, whosoever believe it or commit his life to him will never perish but have everlasting life and then he had a grin on his face and he said i like that you can put your name tonight in that same way as all of those did last night god so loved the world for you that he gave his son and you put your name and say lord i open my heart and my life to you i commit myself to you for some of you, it may be that you're going to recommit your life. For others, you're going to make a brand new start. You want to be sure how you stand before God tonight. I'm going to ask you to do what we saw those people do last night. We've seen people in every continent of the world do. And more than three score countries, we've seen people do what I'm asking you to do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat, hundreds of you. And say tonight, I want to serve Christ. I want to follow Christ. I want to receive Christ. I want to come to the cross. I want to put my confidence and my trust in Him. I want my sins forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to be sure that Christ lives in my heart. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. You say, well, Billy, why do you ask people to come forward publicly? Because Jesus, every person Jesus called, he called publicly. And he said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward publicly and taking a stand in public that makes it count. I'm going to ask you, if you come from that gallery up on top, it's going to take you two or three minutes, so start now. And I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium, please. This is the holy moment. And God is speaking to you wherever you are. And if you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait on you. And after you've all come, I'll say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. Or you can bring your friend with you, but just get up and come quickly, hundreds of you. Back over here, over there, upstairs. You may be in the choir and God has spoken to you even though you're in the choir. You may be a Sunday school teacher. You may be a leader in your church, but God has spoken to you about your need of Christ. You get up and come. Over here on the ends, everywhere, quickly. Parts of the country that have been watching by television, you can make this same commitment tonight. And whether you're in at home, or in a bar, or in a hotel room, you can have that knowledge that your sins are forgiven, that you're justified. And the word justified means just as though you had never sinned in your life. That's how God looks at you through the blood of Christ. He will come into your heart where you are. And if you'll make that commitment, pick up the telephone and call that number that you see on your screen. May God help you to make that commitment that so many hundreds here in Colorado I'm making on this beautiful Colorado evening. God bless you. And this reminder again, as Mr. Graham has just told you, we'd like to talk with you and pray with you, so make that telephone call now. The number is there on your screen. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'll just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559 or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. 
On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, in 1949, a bold and dynamic young preacher set out on a journey that would have an impact on every continent for generations to come. For more than 50 years, and to more than 210 million people, Billy Graham has passionately spoken about the certainty of hope found in Jesus Christ. There are many things about God that I don't understand or comprehend. I accept his revelation of himself. By he's brought races and denominations together toward a common purpose as he's preached in 185 countries around the world. Christ belongs to all people. He belongs to the whole world. He has stood alongside presidents, met with dignitaries and world leaders. And today, Billy Graham is recognized among the most influential religious leaders in the history of the world. From our archive, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel, the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 34. Beginning at verse 34, I want to speak on the subject tonight of Jaws. And I'll tell you why I call it Jaws in just a moment. Here's the words of Jesus. Matthew 12, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof at the judgment. For by the words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we want to see a sign. Show us a sign so that we can believe in you. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. You're only going to get one sign from me. And that's the sign of Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. During the past few months, we've been listening and hearing and reading all about the Hollywood's blockbuster of the year. It's already been viewed by one out of every four Americans. And it's the account of a killer shark in the waters around Martha's Vineyard in New England who swallows victims and delimbs a lot of victims. And they made a motion picture out of it that's shown all over the world. And Time magazines made a cover story of it. And they could only liken it to Jonah and the whale. They could only find that one literary reference in literature of Jonah and the whale. And so the front pages of our newspapers have carried story after story about how people are afraid to go swimming on the beaches in California and Oregon and Washington and up and down the East Coast this past year or this past summer. And then I read the other day about a man in Australia that lassoed a two-ton shark in Australian waters. Well, I can understand that because I've seen a many a shark in Australia. Cliff Barris and I were out swimming one day in the surf and there came running up to us some men and they said, watch out, the sharks are on the way. There was a shark alert up and we were out swimming right where the sharks were supposed to be. And we had a girl in Australia that played in one of our motion pictures, the shadow of the boomerang. She played the part of a nurse and she was a very wonderful girl and she went out with her fiance and the boat got stuck in the water or in the sand. And she got out to 
help lift the boat off the sand and she wasn't in water more than waist deep and a shark came along and took off her leg and she died before they could get any medical attention to her and down in Daytona Beach Florida they said they had five shark attacks on humans this past year but this is the year of the big fish story both factual and fictional. And it's interesting to me that at the same time this picture's come out frightening people, we have another picture called the Towering Inferno and another one called Earthquake. Besides all the B pictures with all their horror and monster pictures that are coming out to frighten people. No wonder people are biting their fingernails off and taking tranquilizers and afraid to move in their sleep at night. There's never been such an avalanche of horror and fright and some of it very sophisticated to descend upon the human race. And in addition to that, we have to think about the atomic bomb and the hydrogen bomb. And so we're living at a time when people, Jesus said their hearts would fail them for fear. And today, if ever there was a frightened generation from almost every angle, it is today. But that's not what I want to talk about. I like Jonah's story, the story of Jonah and the big fish, better than I do Jaws because Jonah was saved, not destroyed, by a big fish. You say, Billy, do you really believe that this fish swallowed Jonah? Notice I'm calling it a fish because the Bible says a big fish was prepared by the Lord it doesn't call it a whale. It does in this passage in the New Testament, but in the book of Jonah, it says a big fish. I don't know what kind of fish it was. It could have been a big shark for all I know. Do you say, do you believe that actually happened? Yes, I believe it. Why? Because Jesus said it did. And that's all the proof I need. If Jesus believed it, then I believe it. But I believe that it took an even bigger miracle for this particular fish to be on the very spot where Jonah was thrown overboard and then by some mysterious programming of an internal computer to deposit Jonah precisely on the spot where God wanted him to be. And with all the things that are happening in the biological world today, people have much less difficulty crediting this story than they did 50 years ago. 50 years ago, they'd laugh at Jonah and the big fish, but not today, after we've seen Jaws and some of these other things. And after all the scientific and technological achievements, and every once in a while, you'll pick up a newspaper and you'll find that a man or a crocodile or an alligator or something has been swallowed by a big fish and they found him inside the fish, having never been digested, whatever. Now, the story of Jonah is one of the most thrilling stories in all the Bible. It's only four little chapters. In fact, you could read it in about five minutes, maybe ten minutes. And the scripture says that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah and told him to go and preach judgment to the people of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh had 600,000 population. And Nineveh was a city that was very wicked and very godless and very materialistic. It was a permissive society. Sexual immorality was rampant throughout Nineveh. And God said, I'm going to destroy Nineveh. But God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And I want you to warn them that they are going to be judged in 40 days unless they repent. But Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Every Christian that is here tonight is called to ministry. Yes, you're called. I didn't say you were called to the ministry. I said you were called to ministry. Do you know what the word ministry means? The word ministry means service. Our Lord Jesus Christ came as a servant to serve. And every Christian is called to be a servant, to serve, to serve God, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve his fellow man. 
Jonah was called of God to go and proclaim the message that God had given him. But secondly, Jonah refused. You know, it's tough to do the will of God. You, you say to God tonight, Lord, I'm willing to do your will. I'll do what you want me to do and go where you want me to go and be what you want me to be. And you're going to find tough going. Because you see, to do what God wanted him to do, it was several journeys away over mountains and forests and burning deserts. And Nineveh was the wickedest city in the world, a city of 600,000 people. He would face disease and wild beasts and highway robbers. And then when he got there, the people may stone him to death. And Jonah began to run from God. Jonah couldn't take it. So he decided to flee from the presence of God and he went down to Joppa and he got on a boat going to Tarshish and the scripture says he paid the fare thereof. And I want to tell you something. If you start running from the Lord, the devil will always have a boat there for you. And you'll always have the money to pay the way. And at first it'll be smooth going you'll say, boy, I've made the right choice. I know I'm not doing God's will, but I'm doing what I want to do, and I know that I have made the right choice. But after a while, you're going to start running into some rough seas. Then the storms and the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the rocks and the reefs are going to come. No man ever turned away from God and found happiness and peace and joy that was permanent and lasting. The psalmist asked, whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? And you know, Jonah thought he had paid the fare. And the captain thought so too. But then the storm came up. And the sailors were frightened. Jonah was asleep. And they said, what's wrong with our ship? Somebody on the ship must have displeased their God. And they began to pray to their gods. Isn't it strange how people began to pray when they're in trouble and maybe they haven't prayed in all their lives? They began to pray. And finally Jonah told them that he was the one after they'd cast lots and the lot came to Jonah. He confessed that he was running from God and they said, what do we do with you, Jonah? He said, throw me overboard. They said, no, we'll try something else first. And they began to row and row and row and they threw everything else over. But the storm got worse and worse and it looked like the ship was going to be wrecked. So finally in desperation, they threw Jonah over and immediately the sea calmed down. And the Bible says that Jonah was caught by a big fish now you think of the jaws that fish had. How wide his mouth must have been. But see, that was a specially prepared fish by God to be there at that precise moment. And let me tell you, when you run from God, you're going to be under God's judgment. And Jonah had three days and three nights in the belly of that fish to think. And brother, let me tell you, he was doing some thinking. And he was doing some praying. He was saying, Lord, save me, help me. I don't know where I am. What's happened? And God said, Jonah, I called you into my service and told you what to do and you've refused me. Now, Jonah, if you're willing to repent of your sin, I'll give you another chance. And Jonah said, yes, Lord, I repent. I'll keep my vow. And the Bible says on the third day, the fish vomited up Jonah. And Jonah found himself on dry land. And the scripture says, and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Now, God doesn't give many of us a second chance like that. But he gave Jonah a second chance. And Jonah ran as fast as he could in every way he could straight to Nineveh. And he went up and down the streets of Nineveh crying out, 
Repent. Turn to God. Judgment's coming in 40 days. Repent, repent, repent. Of course, he didn't expect anybody to repent. But do you know what happened? That was the greatest and most successful evangelistic campaign in the history of the world. There's never been anything recorded in history like it. The king, the people, 600,000 of them repented and turned to God. And God spared Nineveh. Suppose everybody in Washington suddenly repented and turned to God. And the people of America turned to God as we approach this bicentennial year. What a glorious and thrilling thing it would be. And I want to tell you this, if we did it, God would spare us. But if we don't, this country is in for judgment. Tonight, you as an individual can resist God's call to you and go deeper and deeper in sin. Or you can turn back to God and obey God and do God's will. Which is it going to be? There are many of you young people that have come to Texas Tech University. And you have gotten away from God. You need to come back to him tonight and God will forgive the past and give you another chance and another moment to serve and follow him. And I'm going to ask you to do that in just a few minutes. Jonah preached the gospel of judgment. But you know, there was an interesting thing about the message that he preached. There was no mercy in it. He didn't offer the people mercy. He didn't tell them that God loved them. But tonight, I have an opportunity to say to you much more than Jonah said to the people of Nineveh. I can say to you tonight that God loves you and God is a merciful God and God will forgive you. But Jonah didn't say that. He just said, judgment's coming, judgment's coming, repent, repent. And the people repented. And that's why Jesus made this astounding statement. He said, the people of Nineveh are going to rise up at the judgment and testify against you. You see, they repented, never hearing the gospel of mercy and the grace of God in Jesus Christ. But you've heard the gospel of grace in Christ and you have refused to repent. They'd never heard that Jesus Christ was to die on the cross for their sins. They didn't know that God loved them so much that he was willing to give his son to die on the cross. But in spite of that, they repented. And Jesus said, they are going to be your accusers on the day of judgment. They will testify against you. But then something very interesting happened. Jonah was upset. He didn't want Nineveh to, to repent. You see, he was obeying God's call to go and proclaim the message, but his heart still wasn't quite right with God because he was afraid that the Ninevites were going to attack his own country, Israel. And he had prophesied that judgment was coming and he didn't like the people of Nineveh. And he wanted to see judgment come. He wanted to be able to say, I told you so but he didn't know the mercy and the grace and the love of God that would take these wicked, godless Ninevites and forgive them and change them and transform them if they would only turn to him. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is willing to forgive anybody, even you, whatever your sins are, however bad you've been. God says, I love you. I gave my son for you. I forgive you. But Jonah didn't like that, so he went outside the city and got up on top of a hill and looked down over the city and he had a, a hard, mean scowl on his face as he looked down on the city.